Okay. Okay, so you guys can see my screen, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things that makes Visual Sim unique is the ability to do dynamic power modeling from uh, what we have seen with most companies. Now, uh, Apple could be an exception, so don't assume that, uh, you know, I'm talking for Apple or, or know about Apple systems, but most of them end up being an analytical model with some intelligence built into it to be able to take into consideration impact of applications, impact of uh, spikes and things like that. But what we have done is a truly dynamic uh, system power analysis. And uh, over the last three, four years, we have worked on it, worked on it such that we can get the accuracy up as well. I'll show you some accuracy slides as well, and you can see how accurate we are uh, relative to silicon or relative to a large system. So um, you can get a feel for that as well. Okay. Now, why early system power analysis? Uh, the main reason being that uh, we want to eliminate all the surprises prior to development. So the idea is to incorporate these, uh, you know, the power the learnings and your power items into the architecture decisions. So you can do any sort of optimization, but also at the same time, start looking at things like, uh, you know, how can I do some sort of a power management or uh, not just power gating, but an intelligent power management system. So for example, we have a company that's building a robot and uh, what they're doing is they're, uh, Looking at you know, I go into auto auto mode when I'm uh, when I got a lot of power in the battery, but then when I have low power, I go into a manual mode, and there's like a person in a joystick uh, trying to uh, make sure that the power is being optimized so that they can get that robot out of the uh, out of the nuclear power plant. So there is those kind of intelligence also that is being uh, you know adopted by things, and they want to see how long the battery continues to survive if they go if they move into certain modes like those um the one thing that we're seeing is that you know we can create task graphs of applications and i'll talk about that so you can look at for certain types of applications what is the actual power consumption that is happening in the system and uh, scalability that's another piece that you can look at is you know i've got so much power and i've had so much more hardware can i still uh, handle the system there are other areas that are also important, like for example, one of our recent success stories was with AMD on the x86 processor where they have built a network on chip uh, power plane, uh, which, hand, which carries the power information, the control information for the power across the entire chip. So it's kind of like another layer of, for, power, for the power network on the, on the chip itself. So that's something that we have uh, also been involved with. So, uh, and it's a variety of uh, those kind of analysis that has been done. Now, Justin, is your responsibility primarily the mobile or is it the SOC or is it systems? We do SOC. Okay. Uh, I got Scott here first. Okay. Come on. So I'll, okay, I'll go ahead and uh, focus on the SOC now. Uh, Justin, I think it's the, oh, Scott. Can you hear Justin or better now? Scott, can you hear Justin? Well, so I I'm here with him now. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, we're in the same room now. I don't know if you can see our video still, but. You know what? Let me see if I turn off my video if it gets yeah, so any better. I was saying I do SOC mostly. Um, so both for mobile and for you know, Max, um, we all run it through the same power simulator right now. Okay. Um, we don't put performance under the scope of our power simulator right now. We do work with a variety of different performance models. Um, which has been a source of significant effort for us to plug and play with the different inputs to us. Are you, are you question. integrating? Yeah, I guess. Are you integrating the two performance simulator and the power simulator? I guess. I guess. Or are you uh, doing more of a... Uh, or are you doing more of a... 
Yeah, hang on. Can you say that again? It's a little hard to hear you. I think Scott's going to try on his phone. Too. Yeah, I'm going to try to join the audio on my phone. Yeah, I think yeah, I think his audio was better. Scott's audio was better. His audio was better. Scott's audio was better. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. much better. Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. The power of iPhone, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. All right. I know my daughter's giving me a high five for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so okay. just, just what I was asking was, are you integrating these performance simulators into your environment? Are you picking up traces from the performance simulator? Uh, is your goal to try to build a performance within your power simulator? What would be kind of your ideal situation? So right now we're doing a little bit of both. We started out taking traces from performance simulator. We're starting to lay the groundwork to do co-simulation with performance simulators. Okay. Uh, so I think the ideal would be to continue to support both. Okay, okay. And are these performance simulators written in C++, some proprietary language? A lot of different types. Python, C++, Perl, I think. Um, okay. You've got traces from physical devices that we want to be able to run through simulators as well. So we got a okay. very wide range coming in. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'll, I'll make sure I cover some of those things so you can, you can look at that stuff as well. Okay, okay. thanks. Oh, yeah, now the audio is much better. So let me give you a little bit of a concept of how our visual and power technology works. See, the main thing is um, we look at every single function that is in your uh, SOC. Uh, a function can be considered a fetch stage in, uh, uh, on the processor pipeline to like say an uh, L1 cache or to like an MPEG uh, decoding uh, function. So it can be any one of those things can be considered a function. Now, associated with that, we have the timing and resource consumption information. So which means it's a dynamic timing. So, you know, based on whatever data size comes in, based on the buffer pro processing, based on scheduling, all of those kind of things, it'll take a certain amount of time. And we actually compute the power over that period of time that it's uh, present within that function. So, for, uh, and we do it in what we call a state base. So for a certain amount of time, it's in an active state. For a certain amount of time, it's an active state function one. Certain time it's in wait or stall or idle or uh, standby or deep sleep, whatever the case may be, you know, how many other states you have, it moves transitions from one state to the other state. So you can, uh, you know, you can uh, be actually would model on a, even though we do it in a discrete event simulator, we take into consideration what happens every clock cycle. So you can see uh, okay. in, in the system what really is happening. So that's a key thing. So, you know, as you can see here, we have the transition going between states and uh, there's also transition time between states that is taken into consideration. We okay. model the entire system. So anything from, you know, just the processor pipeline to the processor pipeline, the topology, the caches, the memories, the uh, uh, the peripherals, everything, all the way to like building your whole Mac or building a full server. So we can model the entire system. Okay, would you consider it to be like one of the fundamental tenets of the Mirabilis design? Uh, but by the way, what do I call your power simulator? Mirabilis Visual Sim? It's Visual yes. Sim? Visual Okay. That's correct. Visual Sim is our core product. Now, one of the things we did was rather than trying to build a performance simulator and power simulator separately, we have both of them integrated into the same environment. So if, for example, you want to study, you know, how does the power uh, changes impact the performance, you can do that actually within the same simulation model. And I'm going to show you some demos of how that happens. So uh, from your standpoint, your uh, you can you can treat the, uh, the performance as just a uh, you know, series of delays, or you can treat them as the functionality that's happening within the block and based on the functionality that is power changing. So you can be at a micro architecture level or you can be at an analytical level and we support the entire gambit. So that's one of the key things. Now, if you say, no, 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 the performance is, is another simulator, then yeah, you can take that and here, the delays will be focused on just for the power aspect of it. So we can support all of that functionality. So we, so the product itself is Visual Sim Architect. 
there's the visual sim architect power and then there's visual sim architect performance okay and so do external power simulators it sounds like we can plug those in pretty easily but does that require clock cycle granularity of time information no, we can handle it on our side. So for example, say you have a Python script or a C, C++ or system C code, uh, you can be running those on the other, on the other side and you could, uh, um, uh, you could connect up with, uh, with our environment. And then when it changes a state, it can go over to the other side and come back or you know, based on some trigger, go over to that code and come back. So you can either count the cycle. So you can say, hey, uh, you can return back saying it took me three cycles or four cycles, or it can actually be a real discrete event simulator where you can synchronize the clocks in the underlying event calendar. So we support both of those modes. So if this is clock cycle counting, granularity, what's the longest trace that you would say is typical that you've seen your customers using? Like uh, how long of a time? Good question. So now it depends, uh, uh, depends on the uh, granularity, but for example, we have had one of our customers that was building a satellite do a T minus 10 seconds to a T, uh, T minus 10 minutes to a T plus 10 minutes. So it was like a, a 15 billion line uh, run. So we've got those. Uh, typically at the SOC level, we've got customers going up to like uh, five, six seconds. That would be uh, on the upper limit. So that will be like a quarter day to a half a day type run. Okay. And again, it depends on what level of abstraction. So if you're an analytical, it might only take you 30 minutes. If you're micro architecture, it'll take you the whole day. So it really depends on what level of abstraction. I'm gonna show you those different levels of abstraction as well. Okay. So uh, these are the four levels of abstraction. So we have an analytical model. The analytical model is where we are counting cycles and we're uh, you know, changing states as we go along. You, know, you have an LDO efficiency. You, know, you have all these different functional blocks that are consuming power. So the idea is to see over time uh, you know, how much of power is being consumed and at what time I have peaks and things like that. Stochastic takes that to a next level where there's like scheduling the timing delay is more dynamic so for example you have a lot of concurrent resources and they're you know dynamically acquiring power things like that uh, the hybrid is a combination of stochastic and microarchitecture where you're looking now at you know i've got an l1 cache and it's got like a, a request buffer it's got like a prefetch buffer it's got uh, you know sram accesses and things like that to a microarchitecture where i say i've got a branch prediction stage, I've got a fetch stage, I've got a decode stage, I've got like a dispatch, I've got a rename, and I'm looking at power at all of those devices with both the functionality and power. So uh, depending on what level of abstraction, you can pick any one of those, or you can mix and match them as well. So typically what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the instant, which is, you know, show me what the spikes are to the average to accumulate it for each device or looking just at trends saying, you know, over time, tell me, you know, well, how much time it's been in different states, all the way to, you know, advanced study extensions where, you know, you can, we can generate the activity out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, pick up the, uh, is that the right model? No, that's a model. So I'm gonna pick a, a more analytical model where we look at delays, but, the main idea here is you can have a series of parameters. Now, this is our graphical modeling environment. So this is our visual sim modeling environment. Now, when you're running your regression simulations, you'll be using the command line mode um, and you can like, spawn it off onto a server farm. But this is where you're, uh, you know, you're actually trying to debug, trying to understand the model, understand you know, what is really happening in my system. So I want an interactive environment. So uh, what you do over here is I'm gonna go ahead and run the simulation. So when you run the simulation, there's a variety of things. For example, here for each device, gives me cumulative and average, so I can my joules and my watts. While here I can see over time, you know, what is happening. For example, if I zoom into this region, so from here to here, which is about 0.19, so about 190 milliseconds to about 197 milliseconds, each dot corresponds to either a turning on or turning off of one of the devices. That's what you're seeing. The blue line is my average. I think this has got inverted here. 
My blue line is the average, and these are my uh, instant points. So at every point in time, it can tell me what is the accumulation of all the power of all the devices. Okay. So it looks like you got a pretty periodic thing going there. So do you guys have the ability to automate that periodicity? Like for example, if I have not timestamps at which state transitions occurred, but I just have, you know, something that somebody wants to do a back of the envelope, let's say, for example, and they say this block is on for 30% of the time it's active, 20% it's idle, and the other half of the time it's power gated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's pick one that actually does that. So this was uh, this is a model which I was trying to show a dynamic uh, voltage frequency scaling, but uh, this one here is where I can define. So this is a system resource. I'm sorry, I got four system resources, which are each one is uh, can be considered a core or some processing device, and I have a, a traffic generator says for the you know every uh, uh, which is about hundred. Um, uh, I'm sorry, one microsecond. I'm sorry, one millisecond it's going to be triggering and it's going to you know, have this amount of instructions. So for this period of time, it's going to be going into active state. And there's like a, a task shift that says, you know, this, this second one is going to be shifted by a certain amount of time. Uh, this last one is shifted by a further amount of time as well. And then there's a, you know, there's a time when it occurs. So you can, you can automate all of these processes. You know, notice this one here is actually a parameter. So you can run iterations of it where you can run like a large number of variations for these, you know, change mine from like 3.5 milliseconds to 15 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds or make it more random between 3.5 and 10. You can do all of those variations as well. So for example, here in this particular system, if I go ahead and run the simulation, I'll just start with say a single core. So which means, you know, there is, uh, you can see this, so this is, uh, not totally periodic. I, I guess it is periodic. I mean, think about it. Yeah, it is periodic. So it's happening, you know, at these regular intervals. You can see what the latency is for each one of those four operations. And here you can see how they're all accessing the core itself. So if I go in here into this region, you can see that's the first one comes in, then the second, the third, and the fourth. Now mm -hmm. I can take the same model for example, and I can make it four cores, same design. I notice how the power, how the uh, latency has changed. And here now you can notice I've gone from the, uh, you know, the two cores, uh, I'm sorry, I've gone from a single core to where this one starts here, finishes here, this one starts here, this one finishes, this one finishes over here. Now, what I can do is I can um, create a shift here. So it's not all starting at the same time. There's some shifts between them. And here you notice that uh, as a result of the shifting, they, uh, they're all occurring. So this one finishes, then this one starts along, there's a delay, then this one, and then this one. So you can see that within a single core, I can do all of my operations. And you can see associated with that, you can see how the power has changed here as well. So you can see what the average is and what the instant power is. So this one okay. here, if I look at this, this one here looks a little bit uh, different. It's not, it's not uh, synchronous, it's not periodic, it's a little aperiodic or a little asynchronous over there. Now, what I can also do is I can, uh, give me one second. So for example, this current one, I just ran one of these. And you can see, for example, here, that's my active. It's been idle here. You can see my idle, you can see active. So you can get a feel for on a timeline what is happening in the system as well. So if I change the same thing to, uh, 
you know, to where it's running four cores, and then I uh, turn on the uh, I turn on the enable, and I rerun it. Then I can see what happens when I have four cores versus a single core, and how the operation. So, for example, let me do this. I'm going to enable all four cores. There we go. So you can see all four cores are running and go back here. So now you can see what's happening through the system here as well. So mm -hmm. I can zoom in. So this is uh, the four the four different cores. So it's, we can see here, there's the standby and this is the active. So when you have large number of states, it'll also show you all of the other ones as well. Okay, so you're putting in parametrics to generate that activity, right? Can you have different sets of independent parametric equations for different types of blocks within a design? Yes. So these are parametric. These are the parametric inputs. So these are traffic generation. But uh, in terms of uh, you know what they actually are defining, I could have something that's completely off. So for, uh, I'm, I mean, completely different. So for example, here. For each one of the states, I have different equations. So they, they're not all constant. So like, for example, I could put in like an uh, LB, LB efficiency, which is more dynamic. I can add like leakage that is dynamic. So it's not all static. They can all be dynamic as well. Or okay. for example, I can change my clock rate uh, dynamically, things like that as well. Okay. Cool. Okay. So after you calculate power, can we deep dive a little bit into how that power is broken down within the design? I guess I'm thinking of like dynamic versus leakage power and how you assign which power appears on which power rail. Uh, uh, in this model, I don't have it. I have other models where I can break it down a little bit. Uh, but uh, for example, here, uh, let me run this one here and I'll show you this one here. So here, for example, I can break it down where you can actually see at this time, you know, the clock, clock uh, it went from clock max to G3 uh, to the, for this period of time at this point, it, where the processor went to G3. So you can actually see what the transitions are. I can do, I can do one of those things. Um, I can, I don't think it, the, this model has the ability where I can you know, start looking at uh, what percentage of each type, but that is something that you can uh, generate out of the model as well. I don't okay. have it. I'm trying to think if I have a demo that shows that. Um, I do actually, hang on. Even better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, let me see this one. Okay, here we go. So in this model, we break it down the uh, granularity of the uh, of the uh, the uh, power is broken down even further. So for example, when I look at like my DRAM, the standby, active, activate, write to power, write power, all of them are broken down here. So I can actually see what happens for each one of these individual states or individual act actions. And I can see what's going on. I can see whether I'm in a standby state, whether I'm in an active state, I can see all of those details. Perfect. And so it sounds like this tool is clock cycle based. So does this tool have the ability to kind of tag windows? I'm thinking of something like being able to mark when we transition from the lowest perf state into the highest perf state, for example. And the CPU yep. kicks into high, get a bunch of work done at once, then idles down again to view the breakdown of power that way. Absolutely, so that is what this one now, in this case, I only have two states, so it's kind of not very interesting, but I could have it where, let me see if I have a more thing that I already ran. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. supposed to have multiple states. Okay, um, so you can see this one was my active state. That one is my uh, uh, 
my standby, my idle, my wait state. So it's actually waiting. So what I can do now is this particular model. Um, I'm going to uh, enable power uh, uh, power gating. So I'm going to add a power management to the system here, and uh, I'm going to run this in hardware mode. So one of the devices, which is this, one of the uh, you know the functionality is going to be running in hardware. Everything else is running in software. So everything else runs on A53, and this one alone runs on a hardware accelerator subsystem. I'm going to go ahead and let it run. Now, one of the things you will notice, so even though we are mostly talking about power, what you will also see in this particular model, here we go. You will actually see what is happening in terms of the, uh, the performance as well. So here, for example, I get to see how many, uh, how many frames per second am I processing on this processor in terms of the, uh, the video displays. So I get, you know, I get a feel of that as well. And this tells me what's my instant power. This gives me, you know, like more of, I'm sorry, this tells me my average power. And this gives me my transitions for my instantaneous power. Now, hopefully, I enabled the plotting. No, I didn't. Give me one second. And it also, for example, gives me, you know, which devices were active over what period of time, uh, gives me other kinds of statistics on the utilization. So here, for example, is I think uh, this is what you were looking for uh, earlier, where, for example, here I actually had this, uh, this power analysis, which is, I'm sorry, the power management just doing so, you know, during this period of time, it's been going up and down. So it's been changing states, changing states. But then over time, you can see that when a, when a power management kicks in, it drops to a lower state over here. Yeah. So this is picked up for just one, for the hardware accelerator alone. Okay. So is there a way to visually tag which performance state a design is in? I guess what I'm thinking of is, say we want to play with the latency before we power gate our I don't know, let's say a cache. Uh -huh. um, maybe not a cache, let's say a fabric. Uh -huh. So we say we're running a web browser workload. So we're in a high perf state and you know we're running JavaScript and doing all the modern internet-y things. And then there's little bits of time in between bursts of work during which time we can drop into a lower performance state. We can drop down to a lower frequency, lower voltage. We hang out there for a little while in clock gated or in idle or whatever we're calling it before we power gate temporarily. Then more work becomes available, we ramp up again. Is there a way to see how much energy we're spending or how much power we're spending waiting for us to go into power gated? In those yes, lower absolutely. So that's what the system is doing over here. So for example, let me zoom into this thing. So, you know, when, when we're doing all our uh, web browsing and all that stuff, it goes up to the state. And then when it finishes the processing, it drops and keeps going up and down, up and down, up and down. And then finally here it's, it's become idle, which means, you know, there's no more uh, processing remaining. And after some time it drops to a much lower state. And then right here, after some time, it comes back to life again. And you can start seeing the, uh, the activity that's picked up at this point. Okay, so y axis here is, right? Exactly, the x axis is the time, the y axis is the power, that's the instant power. Okay, so is there a way to view the totals of just the regions of interest when we're in that low perf state waiting to power gate? Yes, you can. So there's two ways you can do that. Uh, let, me, uh, let me go back here. So you can actually get individual devices, what's accumulative and average power. That's one thing you can get. The, the second thing, as I was uh, showing you earlier, you can get the... Uh, so now we 
should be able to see this. Hmm. Okay, here we go. So now you can start seeing for every device, so like for example, here, here this is the uh, hardware accelerator. You can start seeing, you know, the black one indicates the idle, then here it becomes active, then it drops down to a lower state and then it bounces up to a different state. So you can actually see from a timing diagram, you know, what's happening to each one of these. So this is one thing you can do. The other one, which is more sophisticated is I can uh, do a listen to block over here. I'm going to go ahead and run it. So this is where I can see for each device when it's moving over to a different state, at what time they're moving over to different states. So this is something that can be fed as an output. Like today we feed this into the battery and we can, uh, we can actually see, you know, like if there are spikes, you know, what happens to the life cycle of the battery, uh, things like that that's and then you know we based on the values it keeps changing we, we have a, a simple calculator that computes what the heat or temperature is as well so you can you can actually model that type of information here also okay that makes sense now we provide you the infrastructure so we do have the ability to break it down to whatever level of granularity you want to be generated to generate the output so even if we don't have it today Either you as a user or we providing the thing can actually incorporate any of those changes we want. Okay. So it's completely flexible either for you to do it completely or we could do it and provide it to you as a, you know, as part of the infrastructure. Okay. And so would that involve modifying the design to add in different components with different, um, different states? Or is there a way to kind of tag a given component to say for this amount of time it's in this state and to this state that state xyz and to filter based on that kind of tagging time windows regardless sure. of what every state it's in sure so for example let me go into this uh, fed state of this one so this is more of our uh, cycle accurate uh, modeling so for example if i go into this one over here i'm going to go into some of this portion of the code here where uh, okay here we go so I check to see, am I, if I, am I interested in doing power analysis? If I am, I do a power update and I'm moving this to an active state. Then I go into my cache fetch and it's taking certain number of cycles to go do that thing. And once it's done, I'm moving it to a standby state. So you can do it this way, or you can uh, do it the way I was showing you earlier, which is uh, this one over here which essentially is, and you know, I'm going into this block over here from this thing called the uh, mapper. So when I send this over here, when it goes active, it, uh, it moves into the active state. And then when it finishes the processing, it moves into a standby state. So here, for example, I specified that I want one, one unit of time is, is the amount of time I want to have this uh, delay to go into the active state. And for the rest of the time, I want to be in standby state. Now there's only in two states, but I could create any number of states. So for example, in this particular system, every device only has two states, but um, I can go to a different model. Like for example, here, uh, every one of these has different number of states. They're not consistent. So for example, the PLL is only active. It doesn't add in an on state. While for example, the clock has multiple states, the, processor has even more states, things like that. So every device can have uh, different number of states. And of course, each state could have its own uh, equation as well. Okay. okay. Cool. So, uh, so that the, the uh, libraries is what enables us to create these models. So for an analytical, we have delay functions. When it gets to stochastic, we have resources. When it gets to hybrid, these are models of processors, memories, caches. So, you know, hey, I want to put an A77 in there, or I want to put a Neoverse, or I want to put a Risk Five. So you have library blocks for that. Or I want to do a microarchitecture where I want to see, uh, 
you know, like the fetch stage or decode stage or rename. So we've got functions for that as well. Mm -hmm. I want to put my clock tree. So we've got a clock tree model. So all of those are available as well. So you could drag and drop components from that, or you could, uh, you know, import the power data and you can run your existing C, C++ or Python code as well to, you know, to, so say, for example, you already have an IP block, which is, you know, you already have it modeled in a different uh, uh, language or different technology. You can import that IP block as well into the environment. We can import our own power models for more specialized blocks. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And you Great. could, you know, the power table, the power table would still manage all the statistics, would manage, you know, like the, the state information and things like that, but the actual activity could be inside your Python or into your C, C++. Now, uh, Perl, okay. I've never imported Perl code, so I'm not sure how you do it, but I think you can call a C++ command to run a Perl code. Okay. So you would do that. So for these power models, um, how do they actually calculate the power? What are the inputs? Ah. So let me start with a simple one. So the simplest, the lowest level is you just have a value like right here. The, you know, you, you have all the different devices and you have a power value for the different states. So that's the, uh, that's the basic input. Then you have a transition time and you could have other expressions, but for now we'll just state that those are the simplest ones. Now uh, you, can, uh, you can have it just with that. So as the simulation runs, it's going to be uh, each device is going to be triggered at different times based on the activity that's being fed to those different devices and or resources. And then based on that, they're going to be changing states. So that's dynamic as far as the model goes. So that is one way to do it. The other way you could do it is here where you have something a lot more complex where you have all these expressions and some of them are uh, static, which means that uh, their parameters, they're fixed and some of them are variables. So they actually are changing while the simulation is running. So these are the initialization values, but as the simulation runs, so for example, if I go into the PLL and I trigger, there's a delay here. So notice here, the earlier one was using resources. This is using a simple delay. So you can see that, you know, I'm moving it to different states over here. So this is more of kind of like a delay with an analytical, that one is stochastic with, uh, with the time. Uh, with the uh, with the states, okay, and you can mix and match these. There's no restriction there. So these could uh, these these variables could be changing over time um, as you run through the model. So like your process. So for example, here each of these colors correspond to certain. Uh, this one's 104, 208, 416. So each one of those corresponds to a certain uh, voltage. Uh, this one's a different voltage, I believe. Let me check. Yeah, that's a VDC. So you can, you can actually have different values come in on each one of these devices. I mean, each one of these ports as well. So that yeah. becomes the, uh, the, either the voltage or the power or things like that as well. So when I come in over here, notice I'm coming in, I can set up my expression, say this is a device name and it gets this voltage and clock over here. Based on that, it's actually computing what is the, uh, you know, so it gets these values. So based on the voltage in, so if the voltage in changes, this value changes, which means my power information changes. Again, for switches, the, uh, the, uh, the number of switches can also dynamically change. So right now I might run like 30, sw 30 device switches may get turned on. Other times it might be only 10 switches. So when number of switches change and I go back here, uh, you can see the switch leakage would be these values, but I can, uh, you know, so that's my switch leakage over here, which would change based on the, uh, you know, the number of switches that are turned on or turned off at that time. Okay. Yeah. So it becomes so more, uh, yeah, go ahead. Possible for each of these blocks to have a completely customizable equation. It looks like it's, uh, it's parsed in as part of the model from text. No, the, these equations are uh, dynamic. So okay. <laughs> you can set up whatever equation you want for each one of those. So they can either be an equation or they can be computed externally. So for example, let's, let's say we just delete all of these away. 
So it's just this one. So this one could be computed somewhere externally and being fed in through what we call a variable. So the, these things here are called variables. So they can be fed in here. So the PLLV is something that you compute. And then when you come in over here, the, where's my PLLV? Here we go. So my PLLV would be a, would be a different value based on what I compute over here. Okay. And that'll be fed in here. So it could, you know, here I'm, I'm picking it out of an array. So I got a fixed value and that's my array. So I'm picking it out of that array, but in your case, it could just be the PLL value itself, nothing else. Okay. Yeah. So you can put any, so, any complex. Yeah, go ahead. A reference state of another component of a design. Like for example, is it possible for a DRAM controllers power model to reference the current activity state of the DRAM itself? Absolutely. Or is that done? Line Absolutely. Up. So the what we have is you can you can get it down to any level of granularity. So for example, over here, when I look at this model, I have my memory controller, which is this block over here. And now this one is a, a cycle accurate microarchitecture memory controller. So you notice it's got all the timings that would be there in a real Micron or a Samsung memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing with my uh, with my DRAM here as well. This is the actual the memory device itself. Now, when I go look at the power table for this one, and I'm just gonna focus on the on the DRAM power itself. So you can see that's my activate standby, my active, the activate itself, the, the right to read power, the right power read power, the uh, RRD, all the refreshes for each of the power banks. All of those have their own line item here. Okay. So, so what is happening? So what is happening? Over, sorry, I'll just finish up this one thing. So what is happening here is, you know, the control signals go back and forth. These are, you know, the powers being, uh, you know, the power may be updated on the memory controller side or the power may be updated on the DRAM. Or for example, the L2 cache is sending power here. Once the L2 cache goes silent, which means it's waiting for a prefetch to return, the AXI bus gets busy. And then when the AXI bus is transferred, the memory controller and the DRAM get busy, and then when, it, when the return path, it uh, you know it updates the AXI bus as well. While well, at the same time, there could be another read going through, so there could be a read and write simultaneously going through the AXI bus as well, and then the power would be uh, would be updated for both the reads and writes independently. Okay. You had a question. I, I kind of cut you off there. The panel you showed a second ago with the inputs for the DRAM, please. This one. Uh, the other one, the one that showed uh, the timing oh, parameters. For oh, DRAM. the timing parameters, yeah, here you go. Perfect. Okay, so the DRAM type DDR4, those are, um, those are built into the model. Those are you know out of the box specializations. That's for correct. DRAM or the exactly. Customer. That's right. These are all standard ones that uh, come shipping. Okay. And, and we're constantly adding. We're constantly adding new ones as we go along. Like we have, we now have HPMs, we have HMCs, we have all of those kind of things as well. Okay. Cool. You're asking some other question. I think when I uh, we cross. I just wanted to see an example of uh, of what's gotten fed in here. Oh, which one? Uh, what you're showing now. This is exactly what I was asking. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we've got those kind of things. So, and this is what I was mentioning that you know every block that we ship has power and performance and functionality built into it. Again, okay. you know whether it's an analytical, stochastic, hybrid, or uh, microarchitecture. All of those devils, we've got, uh, we've got the uh, power performance and the uh, all of them integrated into the same model. So as a user, you don't have to worry about, oh my God, I got to get this data separately from a discrete event simulator. I need to get something here from a time simulator. None of those, they're all integrated. And if you want to build your own custom blocks, either you do your C++ or you can build it like how, uh, you know, you can build it either using our uh, resources or using our scripting language or you know like any other mode as well so we give you all of those options 
Okay. Now this one here matches up a real phone. So we're, you know, this is an uh, SOC of the A77 uh, running in the, uh, uh, running on a real phone. So we're, we're actually capturing the, the cycles per instruction on the, on the phone and we're comparing it to the results on this one. We get the exact same value and, uh, you know, the power accuracy for different frequencies is also matched here. Okay. And I'll show you some um, uh, comparison numbers also in terms of accuracy. So the analytical models are, you know, like this delay function. So you kind of get power based on, you know, how much of a delays you have. Now, obviously you do get the instant uh, power calculation because, you know, if there are multiple devices, uh, you know, requesting for power, you get those instantaneous spikes. So that, that is happening. Same thing with the stochastic. But when you get to this side of the table, the accuracy also starts uh, playing a major role. Yeah. No, here, okay, there was the accuracy. So, you know, for, this is running, I think this one is running the older A53 model, uh, which is what I have the comparison here, but you can see over frequency, this is a simulated power is measured power on the, on the phone. And that's what you see is a Delta. Okay. That's pretty good, those deltas. It is. Uh, actually, we've get, we get much better uh, power numbers. This is on a hybrid model. If you get to the microarchitecture, the power numbers are very close. Like I think at Micron, with their memory controller and their uh, hardware, I mean, with their DRAM, where they're running an actual trace. So this is like a 45 billion point trace uh, running it through the model. We were about 98% on, uh, on the power consumption comparison with the real hardware. Okay, that's and they were running, Yeah, they were running an Axi bus trace feeding into the memory controller. This was from a real, uh, from a real device. Okay. okay. Now, as I said, there's a four ways. I'll just go through the four of them so you can quickly understand. So here's where, uh, you know, the power is a function of both static and dynamic, but the main thing about it is here, each one of these is a delay function. So when I come in, I'm going to one state, when I finish my delay, I go into another state. Now, uh, during that time, this battery or this, uh, you know, battery is generating power, but the, based on the LDO efficiency, the voltage being sent in can change and that can cause some dynamism. So here, these things can change um, based, on the, uh, based on the power activity uh, in my particular uh, design. Sorry, these things can change. These I think are from this value here. Go ahead. Okay. That could be a good way to model power droop. Yes, exactly. That's right. So you can you can drop that. And then and then for example, when I go into the stochastic, the way I was talking about here, you can see these were the you know the power activity. Well, you know, you can see for each of the cores what was the power activity, and you can see the associated task, and you can see what the associated latencies are. So if I, and my associated uh, instantaneous and average power. So if I change this to say, putting in a single core or uh, changing the, sh I shift it a little or do any other things, you can see how my latency changes and you can see also how my instantaneous power changes. The instant power is something that we also tie into our uh, battery because you can see how the battery life cycle changes as well. You can see if the, uh, you know, the uh, battery itself is, uh, uh, you know, how the, uh, you know, whether there's a degradation or we're running out of power too quickly, or for example, I can even uh, you know, introduce a thermal shock in the battery and it can, you can see how the uh, battery life changes there as well. So that's on the battery side of things. I wasn't going to cover the battery side because I assume that you're only interested in the SOC, but we have power generators and batteries also as models. Okay. Hybrid, uh, you know, you can have all these different devices. I can, uh, I can set up, uh, this, this starts getting more detailed. So I start putting in like a, a risk fire or an arm core, setting up speeds, setting up ID caches, accelerator speeds. And I can say, you know, my goal is my peak power has to be less than one watt. Number of matrices I can manage is 19,000 per, uh, you know, per 20 milliseconds. You can have my DRAM, you can have all of these details and that's my software. What this uh, so I, here I'm running the trace and I'm generating an actual trace of a C code like a web browser or uh, maybe music or like a video or a making a phone call and I'm feeding that into the model. 
I'm not uh, running a, I'm not running a, 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 a stochastic or a, a more traffic model, but I'm running an actual trace through the system. So here, for example, I can do a comparison. So this is when, you know, I've got it where everything is running in software. So I have no accelerators to where I start moving to having accelerators. So you can see, I went from about 9,400 uh, you know, matrices with sub like 0.8, 0 0.95 watt of power to where it um, jumps up to about 1.4 watts of power, but I go up to about, uh, nine, about almost 20,000 uh, frames per second to where here I, I do uh, the hardware accelerator plus I turn on power management. So I get it to just about one watt of power but I, my performance is about the same. I'm slightly less than where I was for the earlier one, but I'm still within that range there. So you can do these kind of case studies as well to, uh, you know, to evaluate what happens for different scenarios. How does it impact the power? For more advanced things, like I was talking about what we did with the x86s, um, you can even have your network on chip and look at the delays for requests coming in across the network on chip to, uh, you know, to be able to provide certain amount of power and how that impacts the performance of certain parts of the system. And then of course, on this one here, as I was showing you, you have more details because now see, for example, over here, we're down to the integer branch, the, uh, you know, the floating point, the load store, um, uh, the multiply unit. So you can see the power for each one of those is uh, modeled individually. And this is actually within the code so we have a concept called regex functions. So we provide you these types of regex functions that you can actually insert into your code. And that communicates directly with this power table. So the power table gets updated based on what, what happens with this one. So for example, here with this power manager, and I, I have what's called a hierarchical power manager. What that means is, you know, I can build up these as what we call class functions. So the lower level, each one of these blocks is actually, as you can see here, each one of these is an individual class. So it can have its own power manager. And then I can build on top of that. So for example, the front end, uh, I have the fetch unit. So that could be a, its own power manager. On top of that, I can have the front end unit which has its own power manager. And then I can have the whole SOC has its own power manager and it'll start adding up from the bottom upwards. So the idea is the person that's building up the final system does not need to know the power details of the underlying block that has been created by somebody else who's the expert on that particular module. Okay. So then they're only responsible for the top level. So it will actually add up the power from the bottom most level. So you can have, we've got up to 256 levels of that as well that we support. Okay. Okay. Cool. So that's on the four different levels. And then of course, you know, I was talking about, we have the instant, we have the average. Now this is the trace output I was talking about, which can right now we feed it into our battery, but it can be fed out to an external device. So it will actually tell you that this device as it's showing you, this device goes into this state, like for example, here. Oh no, I don't know. Here, here we go. So for example, this one goes into on state and set power, goes into existing state, goes into a change. There's an update power to active. They think it goes into a standby state. It can go to any one of those states. It can keep changing dynamically. So you can uh, you can use that to you know to trigger something on an external power calculator. For example, right now we have a customer that's taking this and feeding it into a, their own simulator, which is connected directly, but that computes the thermal characteristics of the model. Okay. okay. And we do model failures. I'm not sure if that's important, but you can actually start introducing this is like a thermal shock into the battery. And this one handles all the power that you know gets fed in over here, and you can see how the life cycle changes. You know how much power is remaining. You know what's the heat. This is actually an experimental uh, algorithm that we're using to you know measure what the heat is. Okay, that's more advanced uh, feature that available. Um, you can actually shut down some. So, for example, if my power threshold drops below a certain level, I can turn off some of these devices and then see what happens to my performance of my system as well. Okay. And then, yeah, so this one is kind of like a comparison. So, you know, with, without the power drop and with the power drop, so you can see, 
you know, how the uh, latency, which is at 0.6 or 60 microseconds has, has jumped up to almost, uh, you know, 10, uh, 100 microseconds <clears throat> on the, on the uh, latency as a result of uh, drop in the power, uh, available power. So notice okay. over here, notice over here, the green thing is missing right over here, which impacts yeah. this one. I had to remove one of those cores because I don't have enough uh, enough power to handle that core. Okay. We got to run in a couple minutes here, but one more question. Yep. Um, do you support per rail current? Uh, could you explain that? So if we want to model our PMU, for example, uh -huh. use the amount of current being drawn on each rail, that'll affect the PMU's efficiency on each rail. Is there a way to model something like that? It is. I've never done it before, but uh, I know we can do it. So okay, maybe so we have a simple case where I can, I can even model it and show you how it's done. But yeah, we could do it. Okay, so it is possible. That's all I want yes. to make sure. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Okay. And is these there... are just some of the things we're working on. So just a roadmap I wanted to show you as well. Is there anything you have in terms of um, like how other collaborate with the data? I know you had showed me some stuff in the past about that. Sure, yeah, so uh, there has been, uh, uh, the original reason for doing this was to provide the uh, mechanical engineers what the power profile is gonna be so that they can start computing what the cooling requirements were. That was our original uh, use of this, uh, of this library. And that's why it was originally built. But <coughs> over time, there's been two divergent uh, things. One of them has been, purely focused on power management, which is how do I reduce my power over time? So, you know, how do I key, how do I maximize my battery capacity? So that has been one. The second one has been for different applications, what is really happening in my power system? That's been the, uh, the, the other divergent that, uh, that was seen. So that is, I think, closer to what you guys are looking for, which is, you know, for different scenarios, for different uh, conditions, what happens to my uh, to my power system? <clears throat> uh, and of course, really everything is related to how does that impact the performance of my system? <clears throat> okay, so you guys have some pretty interesting visualizations here. Um, they seem pretty solid. Do you guys have any sort of methodology? Mm. This is a little bit of a long shot, but do you have any sort of methodology for you know highlighting you know notable changes from other simulations? Like if a block is suddenly seventy percent of the power of the system when running a given use case, to highlight that that particular block in that use case. Right that now, sense. yeah, it's a good point. Um, let me show you a quick example. I know we're running out of time, but uh, mm -hmm. Um, so for example, over here, I can uh, you know, keep track of uh, what was happening in my power. I can see whether I'm below a baseline level and if it is, I can trigger true or false, and that can be tracked. So I can keep monitoring to see if the power, if the, my total power is dropping below a level, and then I can keep track of you know, which device uh, was, uh, was peaking at that point. Or I can start generating the cumulative power at every time period and seeing who's consuming the most power. Now, today we don't highlight it. We have something called the Insight Engine, which is working for the performance side. We haven't incorporated that for the power side, but in the next three to four months, we're gonna be incorporating that. And that one will actually give you uh, a lot more statistics. So for example, let me just show you what it does.
See, for example, it will tell you during this period of time, it's not sending out any transactions because the buffer occupancy is uh, full or you know, there's a problem with the buffer. Similarly, it will, uh, not this one. It'll tell you, you know, like what's happening at each time, whether something is exceeded. So for example, the buffer occupancy is this, but then my buffer capacity is this, and you can see over time how things are changing as well. So it, mm -hmm. it'll give you this, this diagnostic engine will, uh, will takes you to the next level, which is actually capturing, um, you know, where you're having problems in your particular system. Let me see if I have that. And do you have anything? diff two graphs or like you know i've gotten two traces with two different variable values and i want to just have the tools show highlight the differences between the two is there a way to do that yes we do so there are two ways the the first way we do it is we have something called the uh, post processor and we can combine two simulation plots so say for example you have run one which is all hardware accelerator run two which is hardware accelerator plus power manager, you can say combine the simulation plots and it'll combine the two and say, hey, here's what your delta is. This is what it looks like. Now, all of the data we write out is in XML format. So you can take the data and do whatever you want with it. So for example, uh, let me take one of these. Uh, let me just run this model. Uh, let's just say I take this and I save it. So you can see for each, so this is the average, you can see what the NX and Y data is. Similarly, you know, if I have any other, so you can so you can actually take this XML file and do any kind of post-processing with it that you want. It's completely available to you. And we do have some parsers that we have done in the past as well for that. Okay, okay. pretty good. Does this make sense for what you're doing? Do you see any uh, benefits of doing this, migrating to something like this? Would this be something of use? So the biggest thing for me is I very much like the visualizations. That's a weak area for us right now. It's all you know, tables of numbers. Okay. Um, I think the biggest concern I have right now is modeling the same design at a bunch of different points throughout the development life cycle of the design. So being able to have a bunch of different teams all working off the same kind of design definition, you, if you'll call it, where they have very different types of inputs available early in the life cycle versus later in the life cycle. It okay. sounds like they are more or less fixed for the different stages of the life cycle if the teams need to be using the same design definition. What would be uh, a design definition, do you think? So you know? Meaning like what blocks are present in the design? Like what granularity you model it at? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, these models, even though I've shown them as you know, like separate analytical stochastic hybrid, you can actually mix and match them within one simulation and also, you can have like, for example, notice in this model, I have the PLL and clock, but if you go out into say uh, another model, this doesn't have the clock. It just has the mm -hmm. hardware and they could exist within the same model itself. So you can, the, the, the your table should, will still continue to remain the same. The table would not mm -hmm. change. It's just that you would drag and drop a different set of blocks and put them into the same model. And, mm -hmm. um, and it can be that, uh, you know, as I said, some of it can be uh, analytical or stochastic. Some of them can be hybrid or microarchitecture. You can mix and match all of those within one single model. It's easier to explain it. So that's why they're kind of all separated out. Sure. Okay. 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 Uh, well, hey, I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure.
And if you have any follow-up questions or you think it does make sense, maybe we can uh, get together again and you could, uh, you know, you could have more questions. We can schedule some time for that as well. Will do. Okay. I really appreciate it. Sure. This is a, okay. I have to say, this is, uh, you've got a lot of good stuff going here. Oh, cool. Thanks. Here that I like. Cool. So hopefully you guys can get to start using it soon. I think Scott would love that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know I was definitely impressed when I saw the tool and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it offers some interesting power that we don't necessarily have or gives us ability to visualize and collaborate maybe in ways that we haven't been able to before. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks so much for taking the time. Sure, Good. thanks a lot. Right. Thanks guys, bye. Yep. Bye. Thank you.